I do it is to try to break it down to keep it simple. I mean, okay. not get into too many terms, you know. Yeah. So okay. that's probably the way it is. I have kept as many pictures as possible and not much, not at all much theory. Yeah. But um, you know, but you know, we'll go through it. Hopefully, hopefully the that's kind of my that it's more easy to understand. Just to break into you, I have some science slide. <laughs> I I want like our people are mostly educated. They 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 should have the background of the science. Or I would say the why us. I have few slides of it, and then I will move to Karthik to present the clinical things. So logo on the token. Yena yena ko niya access kudo kono share slide share screen share slide share screen. ஒரு <laughs> <laughs> it is always on the record button was always on the recording uh, you can okay. see that it's on on the yeah now i see it on the corner yeah. okay we'll wait for a couple of uh, couple more minutes for yeah. people to join and then we'll start no problem Hema Venkata, she is asking the link is not highlighted, but uh, hopefully she will be able to join. Okay, so the ID, tell her that I enter the ID and password. Yeah, I told her that. Okay. Actually, Loh created a ID a link to, you can ask him and forward her. Oh, did you send you, did he send you the link? Yeah, I can send you. Okay. Bharat is sending it. Okay. it will be a little bit easy for people yes, who are now yes. they just can log in just with the link yeah sakti was asking it from the beginning make it as a link because people are you know there are people who just want to click it <laughs> right correct if you don't have the zoom app particularly if you have the zoom app you can just enter the id right But otherwise the link is easier right. right okay i sent her doctor she was very clean in joining the meeting dr hema venkat I probably uh, i don't know if you oh i know her very well absolutely. yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely thank you veda thanks for sharing the link here thank you aparna i just uh, did from this participant screen you can invite anybody yeah oh that's good see if i go into participant screen and then at the bottom it will say invite Mm -hmm. and you can do a copy the link or email or message or anything okay so anybody is doing if you think anybody else will be interested so you can do it yeah i'm forwarding the link to as many as many people as i can right now i think that's how it works so that's how i have done it in my zoom meeting so yeah okay. at least even if they do it password maybe the one whatever you have sent in this will connect them to the zoom section and then password sometime you might have to re enter mm -hmm. yeah uh, but now probably we should start at 734 what do you think yeah it's 734 one more minute will start so do okay. you have the do you have control of the screen um uh, suresh uh lohu has it Oh, I see. I see. Okay. No, we are host. Um, yeah, you no. are also host, uh, Suresh. We can. You are also host. I am also host. So we can have the control. Uh, we have the control okay. of the screen right now. Okay. Okay. I I would pass and again again I will start the recording. Is that what a uh, new recording? Then we can we will have the one yes. from actual thing. Yeah, we can do that. I can see that even I can do it right now. Okay, Aparna, you do it then. Okay.
like go out now still recording so go out then come back and good evening everyone uh, ellarku vanakkam in that time eduthu neenga ella join pannadhukku romba thanks once again this will be our uh, fifth information session on covid idu vande nama red sari michigan uh, chapter avangaloda sendu pandrom thanks to suresh for organizing this uh, uh, information session for us this information se- uh, session will focus on heart disease risk in south asian indians and also an update with doctor uh, with covid 19 uh, that's almost a pandemic right now which is prevailing us which is almost uh, in fear of us we are just getting a little bit out of it right now hopefully it will remain the same on behalf of tamil sangam michigan tamil sangam and on behalf of my committee i welcome dr kartikeyan ananta subramanian and i thank him for his time uh, given to us for this information session welcome thank doctor you. thank you thank you very much for the opportunity appreciate it okay vanakkam uh, ellarku na en peru vandu suresh palaniyandi i am a cardiovascular scientist so that's how i am uh, organizing this uh, with uh, i am part of uh, red sari mission uh, which is a non profit to promote heart health in south asians so that's how we connected uh, with dr karthik ananda subramaniam who is a cardiologist uh, in hendy ford hospital uh, we were co- colleagues so that's how i am connected with him so i before Uh, i hand over the mic to uh, dr karthik i will go through some basics of why south asians have the risk the scientific aspect of it and then i'll take uh, around 5 to 7 minutes then i will hand over to karthik uh, before i go on i just want to um, uh, introduce dr karthik dr karthik ananda subramaniam is a professor of medicine at uh, wayne state university and uh, he tamil la solran illaya vilayum payir mulayile theriyum abinte அது இவருக்கு நல்லா பொருந்தும் ஏன்னா இவர் வந்து மெடிக்கல் காலேஜ் வந்து மெட்ராஸ் மெடிக்கல் காலேஜ்ல படிக்கிறப்பே கோல்டு மெடலிஸ்ட் ஆஃப்டர் தட் ஹி கேம் டு யூஎஸ் தென் ஹி டிட் ஃபெலோஷிப் இன் ஹென்ரி ஃபோர்ட் தென் ஹி வென் டு கெனடா அண்ட் டிட் அ ஃபெலோஷிப் அண்ட் நவ் ஹி இஸ் ஒர்க்கிங் அட் ஹென்ரி ஃபோர்ட் ஹாஸ்பிட்டல் ஆஸ் எ ப்ரொஃபஸர் அண்ட் கார்டியாலஜிஸ்ட் அண்ட் வெரி இம்பார்ட்டன்ட்லி ஐ ஹி இஸ் Uh, um conducting a program called heart smart cardiac screening program which is kind of a preventive health care in the heart area so that's how karthik is very much into this um, um how south asians having higher risk what we have to do about it when we talk about it he as yes suresh we are doing it in overall population yeah, we can take a an angle for south asians alone that's how uh, we did a similar talk last year so a lot of information so that's how uh, today's evening is going to be so i will tell the format for the audience after i finish it karthik will also go through few slides to introduce things and afterwards it will be a f- informal question and answer session um like since um the disclaimer is written in the question and answer uh, if you looked at it it is just an advice provided in the session is cannot be considered as a formal medical consultation all the advice provided is for the in- information purpose only so for your specific case you are recommended to consult an appropriate specialized physician or a primary care provider okay with this note i'm going to share my slide okay are you able to see my slide Okay. Yes, Suresh. Okay. So, the first, first you can see that the, it is diabetic, cardiovascular and diabetic risk in South Asians. So, it is not only Indians, it involves Pakistanis, Sri Lankans and everybody. So, like uh, those who are not familiar, South Asians have four times higher risk of developing heart disease compared to Caucasians, white people. and east asians maybe chinese japanese koreans and we also develop coronary artery disease 10 years earlier than general population and we have two times higher risk of developing diabetes and there is a specific mutation that 4% of south asian has in the heart muscles heart muscle which pump um, our heart to eject blood out 
So that is only 4%. So Shakti, uh, who is on the call, uh, is working on that particular mutation. Okay, this slide I'm sharing is from um, Diabetes Association, American Diabetes Association. And you can see here also it is pointed out that it's two to four times higher risk of developing, developing heart disease if you have diabetes. So diabetes is, you know, many of our family members have it. So it is a, one of a very important risk factor for developing heart disease. So why South Asians? Okay, that's the big question I'm going to show here. You, as you can see is like there is an increased metabolic syndrome. What, what like in Lerman term, if I want to say that, if the person can be skinny, but their abdomen, the belly is bigger. So their leg and extremities like leg and hand, this could be very lean, but they have a belly fat accumulated around their hip area, which is one of the risk factor. Why it is? Because you can see that a blue diagram, I don't know whether you are able to see it like a cartoon. It explains that you have, see there is abdominal muscle, which is a pink color. Under our skin, that is called, we have subcutaneous. Under our skin, we have fat. Then we have, if after the muscle layer, we have fat. That is, we call visceral fat, which is close to our vital organs. Like here, if it is, it's in the belly area, let's say it's close to your liver and you know pancreas like that. So that's not a good sign. So we call a person who is bulkier having, you know, um, a thick a frame overall, a chubby person is okay if he's overall chubby. If he only accumulate the fat in the visceral area that is around organs that is keep uh, on your hip area, then that is maybe a risk for your heart disease. So this diagram explains a little bit more why South Asians are uh, more uh, risky in developing heart disease. You can see this. This is Caucasians, white people. When they have their, if you cut cross section their fat, you can see that the intra, the red color is intra-abdominal deposit and the pink color outer layer is their subcutaneous skin area, right? So under the skin area and this inside the fat, it is quite similar. If you look at um, black people or African-Americans, you can see their subcutaneous fit. They are a little bit more chubbier on their skin. Under the skin, they have more fat, but they're around visceral organs they don't have that much. So, and this is Asians. You can see that this is South Asian specifically, I would call. So that we have more visceral that the red color is touching or close to your vital organs. So that is more red color and you, the pink is under the skin. So Tamil is all known as skin and the fat when they are in the skin. That's why we have a layer of muscle layer. That's why So, South Asians are fat accumulator. So, that's why we are having higher risk of developing these kind of diseases. So, genetically, what is the risk? Okay, so some of the markers from scientific studies that that is particular gene that is lipoprotein IPA gene which is associated with atherosclerosis, this is higher. And there is six gene mutation. Mutation means a change in gene coding, okay, with a particular um, inflammatory marker, which is a activated chemical reaction kind of, that CX3CR1, which is prone to having more heart attacks. And so on, there is another couple of more genes which are having um, a defect which is associated with South Asian. So that's why we are develop, we have more diabetes and heart disease in us. So I'm just going to stop this and one more slide. Okay. So if you look at also, there is a paper which says that South Asian also have narrow coronary artery, coronary arteries which supplies blood to the heart. And uh, compared to other, like here, you can see this particular number you can see so South Asians have 1.56 on particular blood vessels that is it's a tube that supplies blood to the heart and that is higher 1.72 in Caucasian which is reduced 1.56 which is significantly different so which is a statistic way to say it same way here it's a distal one you can see the same it's 0.71 versus 0.83 so that is a narrow artery and we have 
visceral obesity or visceral adipose tissue is causing more diabetes and heart disease is what i want to leave the message at the scientific part so probably kartik is going to cover i think i'm just going to say that okay like what for a common man what is what it does me so there are some non modifiable uh, modifiable risks like genetic either your family history maybe your parents grandparents or maternal uncles they may have diabetes metabolic syndrome hypertension and heart disease then you should be careful that's one thing and uh, gender and age so as we age after middle age we have higher risk of developing it and uh, like it's like around 40 years of male has risk and uh, once post menopausal the risk is also equal to uh, female and as i told uh, there is narrow arteries that could be a reason or low birth weight these are non modifiable we are come with it and we have to understand that part and modifiable biology which kartik is going to explain so it is the your cholesterol thing and hypertension just to re uh, reducing all those risk and then modifiable behavior you know diet and exercise and sleep and uh, socially being happy and all those so like as a scientist who work on cardiovascular disease i especially my area of focus is diabetes in this cardiovascular disease so that's why i'm very much interested in spreading this news that yes guys we have a risk let's be careful and prepared for it like okay we cut the risk by whatever modifiable here we can do that and if it is non modifiable we'll be careful about the things that's that's what i want to leave and move that to uh, the dais to dr kartik thank you suresh um my my goal was primarily to um uh, i'm going to share my screen here uh, i i don't think i still have permission to share, to uh, to take over the screen here it okay. says um it's disabled okay um aparna Logan. One second. Uh, keep. Uh, you can keep uh, introducing, or just keep talking, doctor. I'll just okay. look into sure. it. Okay. So, so obviously, Suresh has given an overview. My goal was to kind of bring everyone up to date with regards to uh, COVID nineteen uh, and its relationship to the heart, because that's kind of uh, uh, leading the concerns for most people. And obviously, we'll we're, we're going to make it as much as an informal Q and A session. So, I'll be happy to answer any questions to the best of my knowledge. to clarify other general issues in in thing but suresh has laid the foundation of the risk consultations and uh, you know this is uh, it's it, this is definitely a substantial thing so i'm just going to uh, move ahead uh, uh, to my screen so can you all see the screen yes okay yes so my goal is to basically spend uh, the next 10 minutes or so kind of updating everybody as to how covid-19 involves the cardiovascular system or the heart in general and apa apa tamil la pesuva i have uh, i'm not completely fluent in all the medical terms in tamil so i will primarily speak in english and then periodically interject with tamil and uh, uh, obviously i want to mundama michigan tamil sangam as well as red sari organization in the effort is uh, uh, really a great effort to raise the awareness of heart disease and saltations um uh, because as you can see the problems are inherent we are definitely at higher risk no question we develop disease early the disease is pretty rampant in us these uh the um, uh risk factors like diabetes hypertension cholesterol issues uh are, are rampant in us family history is is a big problem we can alter family history we cannot choose the genes so those genes are in it but the for the last slide which suresh made was the environmental influence so what has been shown is even if we have all of those risk factors existing in us the lifestyle we choose to lead and the uh, um, and the environment and the uh, way we adapt to the environment makes a big dent in reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease in south asians hello on sunday mail as he mentioned you know eating right uh, adequate sleep less stress maintaining ideal body weight controlling and identifying early risk factors so you know we take the car for service so why would we not go to the doctor some people are afraid to go to the doctors and there may be good reasons for that
But if we are uh, interested in maintaining our car so that it runs well and smooth, uh, it, it behooves on us to go and get the most important aspect of us checked, which is our human body. So uh, obviously, I want to thank for this opportunity and specifically Suresh for actually organizing this. And I, I do have disclosures. I definitely don't claim to know everything about COVID-19. And obviously, as Suresh mentioned, whatever advice or uh, other recommendations that I give is not to be construed as formal medical advice. And you should definitely meet up with your doctor to discuss any concerns you have. And obviously, I have expressed my limitations of Tamil. So I will go in between English and Tamil. So to get all of us on the same page, let us actually define COVID. Uh, uh, COVID. So let's get um, on the same page with regards to some terminologies. So you may have seen a lot of this in newspapers, news, news, audio, news which overflows right now. But here are some simple terminologies. So the COVID virus, otherwise called SARS-CoV-2, or severe acute respiratory distress syndrome, coronavirus. It is also, you would also see something called N uh, next to the COVID virus. And that is because this is a new kind of COVID virus compared to the previous ones that, uh, that has hit the world. Uh, and uh, for the short terminology, we call it COVID-19, which is coronavirus disease 2019. And pandemic is essentially defined uh, in various ways, but essentially a condition which basically affects uh, and, kill, and uh, affects the entire world in very large numbers. And typically the artificial number used there is around 100,000 or more across the world. So the, these viruses, which are the COVID-19, typically a lot of these coronaviruses have been identified in bats. So this virus is uh, said to spread from animal to humans. So that's called a zoonotic thing. And so the most common symptoms of infection with coronavirus, which all of us should be aware of, is primarily respiratory, the, the memory fever, cough, uh, shortness of breath, if you, you know, uh, breathing trouble. And the memory, you know, if we could develop symptoms, those should be concerning, uh, assuming that in this particular day and age, those should definitely raise concern and it, sh it should uh, prompt you to contact the doctors to see if you need to get tested. Uh, if this progresses, unfortunately, which happens in a substantial minority of people, it can lead to lower respiratory involvement in the form of widespread pneumonia, which leads to respiratory failure, meaning the lungs are failing, so you need support on a ventilator, and then leads to multiple organs being affected. And we're gonna focus a little bit more on the heart. Unfortunately for this new virus, we don't have a vaccine. And obviously there's accelerated programs, the England News Locator Pinger, there is one particular company which is now uh, uh, released some early data showing that their initial testing has shown that the uh, antibodies are being created, but we're still pretty far away. I would predict at least six to 12 months away from this being actually uh, released. So obviously we are all in it together and the six to 12 months period, you know, how are we going to uh, handle this? You know, are we going to get it in one form or the other? Uh, nobody knows it. So how is it transmitted? Primarily respiratory, uh, meaning uh, droplets. And, uh, and that is why you see all the um, public restrictions and other things which are going is primarily because this virus has a predilection. The primary way the person gets infected is that the virus goes and attaches to a, a specific enzyme, which is very, very uh, high levels of enzyme are seen in the respiratory tract. Uh, so the inhalation, so it gets trapped in that. And so when people cough, they release thousands and thousands of tiny droplets. And these droplets are the ways the virus spreads. Um, obviously, if you are far away from a person, and that is why the social distancing has become so important right now, it is unlikely that the virus travels and remains in the air because of the size, and so it's less likely that you're going to be infected by that. Unfortunately, because of this droplet thing, if the virus droplets fall on surfaces, these viruses are, seem to be lasting longer than the normal viruses that we are used to in getting like a common cold and other things. And so if a person goes and touches a, a, a chair or a table or a computer, which someone else coughed on, those potentially can spread the infection in a given period of time. And that is why uh, appropriate cleaning methods and disinfectation methods are all important. So staying away from people, avoiding, uh, avoiding uh, direct exposure to people who seem to be sick and doing the right processes of cleaning and disinfecting all are key in preventing this virus transmission. This slide is primarily to alert the public what are the most common symptoms that you should be looking for 
uh, and be concerned about things. And uh, the highlighted ones are the most common. You can see close to 60 to 80 percent of the public in this particular study, you know, coming out of China. Uh, obviously, all our data comes from China, at least at this particular point, because they had the earliest exposure. But we are gathering a lot more data from the United States, and there are some different trends. So fever, cough, you know, sputum, uh, you know, uh, you know, expectoration, sputum, shortness of breath. But one important thing to note, and I can tell you as a cardiologist, you know, it never amazes me how much you continue to learn in medicine, is that the atypical presentations of this disease are happening every day. We, we have basically had patients primarily present with a pure heart attack, nothing else. We could take the patient in, open up the arteries, and bring them back. And as part of the hospital protocol, all inpatients are getting tested, and lo and behold, they actually have the coronavirus. So primary heart attack is now identified as one of the presenting symptoms of coronavirus. And um, so just because you're not having a fever and cough and you're having chest pain, doesn't mean you don't have a coronavirus, you still should seek medical attention, it's key. Then we've had cases of people feeling profoundly fatigued, just uh, extreme degrees of tiredness uh, diagnosed with coronavirus. And then gastrointestinal symptoms, diarrhea, has been another way in which this virus manifests. So primarily uh, respiratory, can be primarily cardiac, and then you can have these atypical symptoms. Key thing is most people sh who are infected show some symptoms if they're going to show symptoms in about seven to 11 days. But as you all have heard, people can be totally asymptomatic. And that's the another big problem with this virus and we'll come to it a little bit later. So what about dying from this disease? And unfortunately, the United States is heading to 100,000. Uh, over the next few weeks, which is, uh, uh, which is very unfortunate. So though forget about the uh, medical terms of case fatality rate. We're talking about death rate. Worldwide, it's about 1% to 2%. And that number may be small, but that's, that's substantial when you're looking at such a, such a large uh, population which is infected. And you can see right away, people who are older have a have higher likelihood of actually dying um, and developing complications from this disease. And coming down, South Asians, you know, again, just bringing the point, there's nothing unique about South Asians and coronavirus, except that South Asians have a high, also have a predilection for higher risk factors, as Suresh pointed out. So cardiovascular disease, people with heart disease, prior bypass, heart blockages, heart failure, uh, irregular heart rhythm problems, all have a predilection to actually uh, get the disease and manifest more severely. Uh, uh, people with diabetes, people with chronic lung disease like COPD, emphysema, asthma, hypertension, and cancer. So in general, I would say about 10 to 20 percent of people with this coronavirus, see, uh, that is the prevalence of hypertension and diabetes, around 20 percent actually in many studies. So uh, a fairly common condition existing with this virus. So to expand on the previous thing is to uh, alert the public about who is at risk? We've already talked about older people and then people who are at the nursing homes and you've seen pretty disastrous consequences of, uh, of a large number of deaths in the nursing homes. Just because these people are already there in a nursing home, that means they're older, they're sick, they have a lot of things going on with them and one person is all that is needed. So the coronavirus, one person infects two, two infects four, four infects eight. It's, it's literally like an exponential kind of spread. Um, and then people who've got uh, immunocompromised states like transplant, if you've got a heart transplant, kidney transplant, any kind of transplant, you're going to be on medications to suppress your immune system. And that predisposes you uh, and uh, to a more a dramatic manifestation of this. Obviously, HIV and other conditions too come into this. And people who use steroids, you know, there are conditions like some people may be on steroids long term for rheumatoid arthritis, lung disease bowel disease, etc. So though steroids, as you, as you should know, if you don't, suppresses the normal immune response to some extent and, and exposes those people to risk of disease. Kidney disease and dialysis, a substantial number of dialysis patients. Henry Ford Lewandu, my wife is a nephrology doctor, and I just look at her patient list because I also interact with the same patients. A majority of patients with kidney disease on dialysis are COVID positive. You just test them. They come in for relatively non-COVID conditions and they're already COVID positive. So again, an immunocompromised state. And we've already talked about, uh, you know, 
I don't think COVID affects South Asians in a unique way compared to the other people. So there's nothing unique about it. Uh, people have looked, I think there are studies going on. Um, one thing which I would alert to is there is early data coming from the United Kingdom and they, they have identified something called BAME, B-A-M-E, Black and Asian uh, populations. Almost all healthcare providers in the UK who died from COVID-19 were either African American or Asian Indians, which means Pakistanis or Indians. Uh, it's unclear. It's unclear why that is the case, but so much so that now the, um, the doctors there are given a form and they have created what is called a BAME score, particularly for the uh, uh, ethnic doctors, like Asian Indians, as well as the African American doctors, they are doing a risk score. And if you fall into the moderate to high risk category, you are considered high risk for development of COVID. It is unclear why that's the case, whether it was just a sheer coincidence that so many uh, Asian Indian doctors were in the front line and got infected. But uh, that is something we continue to learn. But at this time, there is no clear evidence that uh, South Asians have a peculiar predilection to this disease process, except for the fact that they have a lot of risk factors, as we alluded to earlier. This is a diagram to show you how the virus pro uh, progresses and how the heart may get involved. So you can see the early stage of infection, very early, people can be asymptomatic. Um, uh, and that's a, you know, that's a substantial number of people. So uh, just because somebody is not manifesting symptoms doesn't mean at this particular stage, we should not socially distance from them because particularly the younger people who don't have any issues, they may be just transmitters of the disease rather than manifestors of the disease. So we've got to take all the precautions. The second stage is where the lungs get involved, as I told you. And then in a, about 20% of these people, COVID progresses to dramatic inflammatory stage. And this is the, probably the most uh, feared stage right now for doctors, where the entire body develops an inflammatory response to the virus and it attacks all the organs. And unfortunately, the heart takes a pretty big hit uh, in that case. And so you can see the heart, uh, if we ask how does the heart get affected by COVID, uh, we don't know the exact thing, but there are multiple mechanisms. It is thought that the virus could directly hit the heart because of the enzyme, the ACE2, ACE2 enzyme is where this virus goes and binds. Uh, it could affect the heart due to that inflammatory response I spoke to you about. And finally, the heart could secondarily get affected because the lungs are taking a big hit and we all know that the lungs and heart work together. And so the manifestations are people can manifest like uh, uh, heart attacks. Uh, so the blood test will indicate heart attack like damage. About 20% of people I see in the hospital for consultation have uh, in, uh, blood, blood enzymes which are positive for a heart attack. They may not turn out to have a heart attack, but it means that their heart cells are dying from inflammation. And we've got to figure out if it's related to COVID or not. And many of the cases, it is related to COVID. And then people can develop irregular heart rhythms. So these people have to be monitored. Uh, they can develop a heart attack, as I spoke to you, and then they can develop acute heart failure where the heart just doesn't function properly. And so uh, this just shows you the wide variety. So EKG, uh, the electrocardiogram or the EKG, which we do can show a heart attack. We can pick up rhythm problems in this condition. People can progress on, on to what is called heart failure, which is basically a weakness of the heart muscle. And we had some, uh, one young patient, and this is a 29-year-old patient, no, no prior history, present with acute, uh, acute amount of uh, building up of blood around the heart. That is called inflammation of the heart lining. He's, he's got nothing else going on. And he, we had to take him urgently, pull out all the, flu, uh, all the blood, and it landed up being COVID positive. So... So you can see that the heart gets attacked in many ways. And the question really, I think it's, it's the public's mind is who should be tested? You know, why can't I just go and have a COVID test and other things? So unfortunately, the United States is not set up like that. And I, and, uh, I, I think everybody can, ha I'm sure, have their own opinion. But my personal opinion is we could have done better. Um, I think we had a period of time where we could have really ramped up our testing and we don't. So right now we are trying to uh, trying to catch the disease rather than being in front of the disease. But this is where we are. We test hospitalized patients who have compatible symptoms. So if you come to the hospital with symptoms, you're gonna get a COVID test at this particular point. And uh, now we have the facility in many of the Michigan hospitals, including Henry Ford, where they turn around time for the test is within 24 hours. We can get our, and in many cases, it can be within the same 
uh, day if we, if we do it early. Um, and then any healthcare personnel who basically show signs and symptoms of, uh, of the disease, obviously healthcare providers are high risk, particularly the front line. I wouldn't call myself as the front of the line completely, although I take care of these patients. I, uh, I think the real frontline people are the emergency room doctors, the nurses, the ICU doctors, and the respiratory therapists and other people who take care of these patients day in and day out. Well, I serve primarily as a consultant for many of these patients. Um, and then you can basically see people who have symptoms who are older, immunocompromised and medical conditions. So you can see that we are actually what we call triaging which patients we should test because we just don't have the capability of widespread testing like South Korea is doing or for that matter, China is doing. China had a resurgence of, in Wuhan, and they just basically said, we're going to test 11 million people in 10 days. That's, uh, that's unheard of. Uh, how do they do that? I mean, they're literally going to do a 1 million test in 10 days. So that, that kind of capability is not there in the United States. That's why people who are asymptomatic, if you don't have it, you just don't, uh, you can't go in and get a test without a prescription. Although there are some sites which are coming up now where they are opening up the capability of of uh, people just going in and getting tested. Now this slide, uh, the way I would ask you to interpret it is look at the thickness of the arrow. That's the clear way. You can see that most people who develop COVID get better. So that's the good news about it. Uh, most people get better uh, and some people don't even know that they have it. And then as minority of people, particularly in the moderate and severe disease, uh, go down and uh, and gets and that gets pretty serious requiring ventilator support and other things. We can't we cannot exactly say who's going to, who that person is, because as you know, the older you get, we know certain people are at higher risk, but then we have people recovering and then we have people dying. And then we have the younger folks. I can tell you, I took care of a 30 year old uh, doctor who's a runner who basically came in with COVID three times in one month, very sick. Now, what, what would cause that for, for him? I don't know the answer to that. And I don't think we all, we know it. We don't know why some young people develop a pretty dramatic thing and why other, most people recover. But this is the natural disease history. Now, some people have asked, what happens after I develop COVID uh, to the heart or to any other organ? Am I going to get better completely uh, or is there going to be long-term damage? Unfortunately, we are dealing with a, with a new disease, which is not like the usual ones. We are already seeing patients coming back to the hospital within a month to five weeks to six weeks with recurrence of lung disease and even early changes of fibrosis. This is not like a flu where you're sick, uh, sick like crazy for a week and then you get better and you're up and about. This disease seems to have lasting effects and we are learning it at this time. Uh, there is evidence that it may actually cause permanent scarring and fibrosis in the lung. We don't know what the frequency of that is and I think we will learn as we go. So this is the problem. And, uh, the same thing for the heart. You can see that I put in the second part of this uh, slide is we have seen patients who completely recovered from COVID present a few weeks later with severe heart failure. So uh, the message again to the public is just because you've had it and done with it, don't ignore other symptoms. So if you are developing shortness of breath, recurrent chest pain, palpitations, other things, you should be alert to it. Talk to your doctor and probably find out if something is going on because it appears that this disease seems to have delayed effects in people recovering and even down the line. So that is kind of an overview. And the question is, uh, are we doing all what we need to be doing to prevent our disease thing? So uh, I'm not going to uh, preach this again because I think you've heard it at nauseum uh, from the news and everybody. So washing hands, obviously that's the easiest, cheapest and free way because essentially that, uh, that helps to kill the virus. Maintaining social distancing, that is you know, ideally six feet. Uh, obviously that means you, the virus doesn't travel that, that far away to actually get there. And avoiding touching eyes, nose and mouth. So if you're, if you're actually going out and touching all these things and uh, remember that the human, the normal person touches their face, I don't know, a hundred times a day or uh, uh, some, sometimes even more than that. So we just have to develop a new sense of discipline. So when I go to the hospital, for example, the first thing I do is to grab uh, a disinfectant and I just go walk with it, clean my door, open my door, go inside, clean my computer, clean my table, do everything um, uh, and dispose it off. 
And then obviously I changed to my scrubs because I'm in the healthcare stuff. But I think the same thing is going to have to happen. It's going to be very interesting to see how many of you who go back to work, what your companies and other things are going to do. A lot of it's going to be remote. A lot of it's going to be 50% for, people, for the folks only coming back. You're not going to have any more socializing. And there's going to be a lot of cleaning and disinfecting going on. Because that's the only way we can kind of prevent immediate spread on this. And essentially, if you're coughing, if you're sick, don't, don't come in. Don't go, in, uh, don't go to near anybody. Stay away from your family. And obviously, the wearing the mask is primarily because the mask doesn't prevent you from getting it because the virus will still get in through the mask. The mask prevents other people from getting it from you, which means when you cough, instead of your droplets going out, you're getting it trapped in the mask. If you don't have a mask, obviously you need to have a handkerchief or something like that to actually cover yourself and go from there. And if you're not feeling well, then you notify your employer or other things like that, to isolate yourself from the family, call your healthcare provider and probably get tested in the right way. And what happens if we do all of this? And you've all seen this one in CNN and all of these news channels, right? So this one is basically how the hospitals in New York and other places just got overwhelmed because so many people were getting infected and they were coming to the hospitals, the hospitals couldn't handle them. And even now they actually have all of these vans with unfortunately all the dead bodies and the freezing vans sitting outside because they just have cut so much. So the flattening of the curve at the bottom is essentially where we are doing all the right things and the public is doing all the right things. The disease is slowing down. And in that scenario, we are spreading the, uh, we're spreading the uh, infected people over a period of time, slowing down the disease so that the healthcare system doesn't get overwhelmed in general. This virus, in my opinion, is not going to go away. It's going to become seasonal and we need to be ready for it. And we need to live in a new world of cleanliness and disinfectant until the vaccine arrives. I think that's, that's where we are. And even with vaccine, as you all know, even if you take a flu shot, you can still get the flu uh, in, a, in a milder way, at least at this particular point. So uh, only time will say with regards to how to go from there. Now, one of the biggest factors is dealing with stress from COVID. All of us have been trapped in the houses. We've not seen our loved ones. We can't travel. We cannot socialize. Uh, you know, my parents are in India. They are struggling and I can go and help them. I'm sure all of you are facing this situation. So I think the key thing is we have to all tune our, tune our minds out. You know, we, the only thing we listen to when you turn on the news is COVID. You know, after some time it gets so irritating. So the first thing is to just tune off, do something different, take walks, watch a movie, spend more time. This is the best time to spend time with your family, uh, take care of your body, exercising regularly, meditation, eating healthy, getting good sleep, uh, and avoiding too much alcohol and drugs. Those are all the uh, things that we can do. And I think, you know, we have to thank the, um, the IT and the internet and other things for helping connect all of us, right? I mean, this is amazing. Imagine if this happened 25 years ago uh, and we, you know, we'll be in deep trouble. We can't see anybody. This is amazing that we're able to lead some semblance of normal life and socialize despite being able to be trapped and doing that. So you know, you're definitely taking time to unwind. There's a lot of good advice. I'm not going to go over this. It's available on cdc.gov, but we'll just, I'll just stop here. Uh, I'll be able, uh, happy to kind of open it up to an interactive discussion and uh, answer whatever I can if I know. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Karthik. That was a fabulous uh, talk and uh, you gave, you touched upon everything that we need to know. Uh, before going on to the open floor, there are people who already sent questions. I'm going to read to you so you can answer them without revealing their name. Some of them may be personal. I don't know how much personal you can go, but if you can give a general answer, it would be great. Um, before asking the question, I would like to take, take this opportunity for whoever there and the audience. Thank you very much. And Tamil Changatirku, Mika Periya Nandri, Narayya Makkal Sendirkanga, Amba the Perikita Vandirkanga, Angul Klang is a Patia or a uh, why South Asians are at risk and how to avoid uh, heart disease in general time as well as in COVID uh, situation. Thank you so much. I'm going for the Thank question. You. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. The first question is how to avoid cardiac arrest? And yeah, the same person asked in winter time, why getting red dots while pressing and kind of blood clot in toe fingers? Ah, okay. Okay. So, um, 
So how to avoid cardiac arrest when they, it's a, it's a very broad question. I, I don't know whether the question is framed towards COVID versus thing, but obviously, as I showed you, uh, I mean, we cannot control what happens in the heart. So the only, only things we can do is to prevent cardiac arrest by doing the basic preventative things, you know, obviously over exertion or unaccustomed exertion. Um, you know, anything which uh, irritates the heart is a problem. COVID, as, we, as I told you, can attack the heart and be, as be known to have cardiac arrest. Uh, one thing I would take an opportunity to say right now is there is no evidence that taking hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine is effective for prophylaxis. There is no evidence. Even treatment is now proven in a randomized trial to be of no evidence, so let alone. So, I, I, and the reason I say that is it's got relevance to cardiac arrest. Hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine prolongs the relaxation time of the heart and can precipitate very serious heart rhythm problems leading to arrest. And you may have all heard about a, a North Indian doctor, a young person, 21 year old who took uh, hydro, uh, chloroquine and, and had a cardiac arrest and died uh, in India. So I would say, d uh, don't take those medications at uh, this time. Uh, trials are going on. Henry Ford is running the WIP COVID trial, which is a randomized trial, the randomizing healthcare workers to chloroquine to see if there's any benefit. So until we have high quality evidence for that, um, I would not take that medication because it can cause cardiac arrest. And obviously uh, the other things are controlling blood pressure, controlling diabetes, things which can cause you to have a heart attack, which can then lead to a cardiac arrest um, is, is potentially an issue. So, you know, healthy life, meeting up with your doctors, knowing your risk factors, uh, because uh, there is premature death in Indians, no question about it. South Asians die much earlier. There's a lot of uh, early heart disease in South Asians. Uh, and I think a lot of it is also driven by extreme stress and too much work. Uh, a lot of doctors in India have died young and there is a huge, upro huge uprising about why doctors are dying so early in India. And I basically think it's just doctors don't take time for themselves. They're working 14, 15, 16 hours, seeing 80 patients a day, not eating right, uh, sitting all the time. And, uh, you know, that, and then they have all the, all the risk factors. They have the bad genes. So they're not doing any environmental modification to make their life better. So I think that's important. You have to take care of ourselves. The second part, uh, I, I believe it's something uh, almost like uh, they're talking about, is that a Raynaud's phenomena kind of thing? They said that in the cold weather, they get some redness of discoloration in their fingers. Yes, yes, that's correct. Yeah, so that needs to be examined. You need to be seen by a doctor. Uh, it could be chill veins or uh, what is called Raynaud's. So if you're unduly sensitive to cold, you can have constriction of the blood vessels, which can lead to discoloration. So that's like a, it could be a condition called Raynaud's phenomena. I'm, just, I'm not saying you have that, but definitely something which will need to be evaluated by a doctor. Okay. Karthik, just to clarify, can you explain the difference between heart attack and cardiac arrest? Sure. So a heart attack is basically where one of your heart blood vessels get clotted, which means a clot enters and, and uh, blocks off your artery, which means that your muscle is not getting blood flow. So if you leave that without atten attention, you're going to have damage to the heart muscle. So people with the heart attack don't automatically die. So right, right now, the, it's so, technology is so advanced that if you get to the hospital, you can have your arteries opened with an angioplasty and get a stent put in, and many people lead a normal life. If a heart attack can progress without attention, enough heart muscle can dam get damaged and that can lead to abnormal heart rhythms and you can die. But cardiac arrest can happen due to many reasons. You, for example, if you go out in the winter and rake and, and uh, shovel the snow, that's a common reason why people uh, develop acute heart attacks and die because that profound coldness causes constriction or narrowing of your vessels due to the cold and that can precipitate acute heart attacks. And then medications can cause, bad medications can cause cardiac arrest, uh, high blood pressure, uh, you, know, uh, you know, uncontrolled blood pressure can do it, a um, lot of reasons. And then inherited conditions can do it too, like heart failure and other things. Like that. So I'm just asking this question because it's, again, I want to clarify that what is the symptom? Like if somebody know whether they have a heart attack or cardiac arrest, is, can it be distinguished? Yeah, well, yes. Heart attack, you're going to feel chest discomfort, which is the classic symptom. Right. And typically, that's like somebody is sitting on your chest and you can't breathe enough and you're getting some kind of vague sensation which goes to your neck and arms. But people can have different manifestations. So you're going to know that you basically 
are, are getting into a heart attack most of the time. Some people can have silent heart attacks like diabetics. Cardiac arrest is, uh, I mean, I wish you would, I mean, most people will not know because it's acute usually. And, uh, you know, it happens within a matter of seconds where your heart just goes into what is called fibrillation and then the heart just stops. That's the most common reason. And uh, if, if not intervened upon, you will, you will essentially die. I go to the second question. Are there any common symptoms observed with all Asian heart disease patients? Reason for this question is I have some continuous burping and bulging for last three, four months, feeling some crackling sound below right chest. Digestion doesn't seem to be an issue because bulging happens irres irrespective of me taking food. I'm worried. Can this be heart disease by any chance? I will do check once the COVID situation subsides. Meanwhile, wanted to hear your opinion. Um, you know, it's tough to say. I mean, the symptoms don't sound like because it's been going on for a while. And again, we'll have to go into the, de you know, go into the details. Uh, it would not be possible with this particular conference uh, things. You know, is it, is it coming on with exertion? Is it coming on after eating? Because sometimes heart disease can manifest after eating. Because remember that when we eat, the blood gets into the, goes to the stomach area first because to help digestion. So if you've got heart disease, the heart will not get enough blood and people can develop abnormal symptoms right after eating. But most of the times, the symptoms come on when you're exerting yourself or when you're angry or upset, uh, you know, emotional stress. Those are the times when you're actually feeling heart symptoms in general. Uh, your symptoms, whoever it is, sounds more gastrointestinal, but it needs to be further evaluated and checked by your doctor. The next, thank you. The next question is, can vitamin B12 or vitamin B2, B deficiency play a role in the heart disease? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, meaning in general, vitamin, vitamin deficiencies, yeah, it's, it's multiple. B12 is primarily the absorption happens in the stomach. So you can basically develop a, a nutritional deficiency because the stomach is not absorbing it properly and that can be replaced. Uh, you know, vitamin B6, which is, you know, thiamine, the time and deficiency can manifest in the form of heart failure as well as rhythm problems and other things. So, so the answer is, in general, B12 is more of a systemic problem uh, where you can get neurological problems, spine, you know, like in the nerves and other things. B6 can be a primarily a heart-based problem. And vitamin D, he also asked about vitamin D. Yeah, you know, there is, there is the uh, uh, relationship of vitamin D to hypertension, but primarily vitamin D is bone, kidney uh, uh, are all involved in it. There is not an immediate direct effect. There is some data to suggest that vitamin D may affect cardiovascular outcomes long term, but that is controversial. I don't think it's, there is no data to say that if you supplement yourself with vitamin D, you will prevent heart disease. That's, right. that's what I was getting. To. Okay, very good. So thank you. Next, I'm 36 years old, having high BP. I'm taking a BP medicine. Is possible to completely stop medication and control BP? Um, the, the answer to it is we need more information. And uh, in general, um, I would hope that uh, your doctors who started you on the medicine first gave you an opportunity to correct your blood pressure with just diet, exercise, and lifestyle. Because when you, you know, barring a few exceptions, hypertension treatment is lifelong. Um, and the reason I say that is in some people who are very young who develop high blood pressure, there may be certain secondary conditions which are causing the blood pressure. Like for example, if you develop thyroid problems, severe thyroid problems, you can have high blood pressure. You correct your thyroid problem, your blood pressure goes away. So sometimes reversible causes can be identified. But if none, there is no reversible cause mm -hmm. and you're having the garden variety high blood pressure, most of the times what we do is we give the patient an opportunity to mm -hmm. uh, see if it can be controlled by losing weight, exercising, eating right, maybe cutting back salt, getting more sleep. Um, and we look for other reasons which may be causing the blood pressure problem. And if the blood pressure problem remains persistent despite correcting all that, then medications are started. Mm -hmm. And most of the times people tend to remain on blood pressure medicines long term. Mm -hmm. Very, very good uh, coverage of uh, everything for that. So um, next question is, uh, what heart conditions make patients more vulnerable to COVID-19 and how is this managed? Correct. As we talked about, uh, I think, you know, uh, when we talk about heart conditions, 
I think people who have had prior heart blockages, coronary artery disease, prior bypass surgery, prior angioplasty, heart rhythm problems like atrial fibrillation, or heart failure where the heart is not pumping properly. Okay, the heart failure can be either a pump problem or it can be a stiffness problem. So all of this, it's not unique, but the fact that you have all of this along, and most of the times when people have all of any of these disease processes, they probably have high blood pressure, diabetes, and they're probably on the older side. So it's the combination of all of those factors which predispose to COVID. Uh, there is nothing otherwise unique about it. Um, it's just that the body is affected by so many of these medical conditions that it's trying to cope up with. And then when COVID hits it, it takes a toll on that. Okay. Thank you so much. So Aparna, now we can open, uh, uh, read the questions from the chat window. Do you yeah, want to talk? I was, I was just getting to ready to do that, uh, Suresh. Okay. Uh, doctor, we have been receiving some questions in the chat window. I'm just going to start reading them. Sure. Uh, the first question is, is it recommended for diabetic patients to take cholesterol, reducing medicine, even though the cholesterol is well under control? Um, the answer to the question is yes. Uh, 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 at least the current evidence supports the fact that if you are, uh, if you are 40 and uh, above and you have diabetes, that there is basically uh, evidence to suggest that cholesterol-lowering medicines like statins may be helpful. Now, there is a caveat to that. And the caveat is essentially, um, if, you're, uh, if your cholesterol is completely normal and you are a, a mild diabetic, meaning just because you got diagnosed with diabetes yesterday, that doesn't mean you have the same risk for heart disease as a diabetic who has been a diabetic for 10 to 15 years on insulin. So it's not diabetes, yes or no. It's diabetes, duration, severity, other organs being involved, all of that goes into the heart disease risk assessment. So what I do for my patients who are hesitant to take that is we now have testing available where we can actually test for early heart disease using something called the calcium scoring. It's called coronary calcium scoring. It's a very simple CT scan, which is done in one to two minutes. So if you have a diabetic patient who has a completely normal cholesterol, one option, if the patient is hesitant to take that, would be to do a coronary calcium score. If your calcium scan shows that you don't have any calcium in your coronary arteries, those may be patients where you could potentially avoid initiation of medications and continue to work on type diabetes and lifestyle control. And the reason for that is, if you don't have any calcium in your heart, your risk for heart disease dramatically falls, even in a diabetic. So that's, that's the way I would approach that. It's a shared decision making in general. So I would talk to the patient and, and uh, you know, explain to the patient that they probably, you know, they, I, I understand their concern. You know, why do you take a medicine if your cholesterol is completely normal? And I would give them this option. I would say typically diabetics are higher risk, but we can try to clarify that for you by doing the calcium scan. Thank you, doctor. Uh, pardon me if I'm uh, saying this medicine name wrong. It says, uh, does taking omeprazole for longer time leads to heart disease or weak heart muscle? No, there is no evidence for that. The omeprazole is a, is a, a stomach acid blocker. And so uh, to my knowledge, there is no clear evidence to say that long-term use of it directly affects the heart. Um, this next question is almost truly a South Asian question, I guess. Uh, does the traditional food habits of South Indians truly help? either preventing or suppressing COVID-19 infection as everyone is drinking rasam regularly in our Birmingham community? Well, I, I would have rasam regardless. But <laughs> I, 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 you know, I love it. But, uh, you know, I don't think we have any evidence to say that vitamin C, zinc, uh, you know, spices and this and that help it. But, you know, as they say, party vaidyam, right? So many times what our grandmas did for us seems to have some actually scientific basis if you actually dig into a little bit deeper. I can tell you that there is no formal evidence. What I would suggest is that a nutritious balanced diet is more important than taking supplements. So, for example, the vitamin, I mean, I, I, I like to badmouth the vitamin industry every time I get a chance because it's a multi-billion dollar industry and my patients just spend an enormous amount of money. And I sit with them and say, listen, just throw, these medicines are useless for your heart. Uh, you know, save money, 
and eat a good diet. There is absolutely no evidence that taking multivitamins is beneficial for your heart. I'm not talking about other things. I'm not an expert in that. But for the heart, it's useless. If, as, if you take a balanced diet and you're not, uh, you're not crazy about cutting back all the nutrients in your diet and other things, you eat plant, you know, uh, vegetables, fruits, uh, you know, vegetables, fruits, and a, and a good fiber-based diet, and uh, what we call anti-inflammatory diet. So in, the Indian South Asian food has got nice anti-inflammatory components, but it also has inflammatory components. And that's what we need to avoid, you know, excessive white rice, excessive uh, processed uh, foods, sweets, this, all of that. The, the sugar is the inflammatory component. So whereas all of our the spices and the other things that we do use, I, I wouldn't have any problems if somebody wanted to drink rasam. I, I think that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Just um, to add, Aparna, like uh, that's uh, like uh, I have a pharmacy background. So in pharmacognosy, which is only studying about plants and mm. medicine, so we have a lot of components, uh, mm. you know, uh, spices, mm. um, um, medicinal values. So as uh, Karthik pointed out drinking rasam or, you know, the spices in your uh, diet, you know, turmeric, all those definitely would help. As again said, frying food is not good. Oil food, not good. Aparna, just point out one question uh, on the top. Probably somebody asked about the aerosol at the dentist office. I was going to ask that question. Um, uh, one person has asked for thoughts on aerosol at a dentist office. So any aerosolizing procedure is high risk for COVID transmission. So uh, uh, what I would say is obviously, I'm sure the dentist's office has some uh, uh, guidelines, but I will, I, will, I will basically say if there is an aerosolizing procedure going on in a dentist's office, the patient has to be tested for COVID before they come for the procedure. Because, and that's the current policy at, at pretty much across the board at Henry Ford. So if you're coming for a procedure to any of the hospitals, let's say for Henry Ford, uh, you know, I do some aerosolizing procedures like uh, I do transesophageal echoes where I put tubes down and take a look at the heart. We need patients tested. We will have to have patients tested one to two days prior and have a negative COVID test before coming in. And so if the dentist office is doing an aerosolizing procedure, I'm sure they will be asking the patients to be tested for COVID because uh, that is a high, that's one of the ways of transmission of COVID. Uh, the next question, is, is there an easy or a clear way to distinguish COVID-19 from the seasonal flu? Usually we get into a panic mode once we see some common allergy flu symptoms. All right, you know, that's, that's a good question. And you know what? I know that there are some, uh, there is some literature out there which says that if you got a tickling nose or a runny nose and other things that could be flu uh, versus other things. You know, I would be careful with that. But in general, I would say most people with COVID tend to have fever, cough, uh, uh, you know, like chest pain, cough, uh, you know, uh, uh, pain, throat pain, etc. And they don't, usually don't have a, a runny nose um, in general. But bottom line is if you have upper respiratory symptoms right now, um, you know, uh, if there is a concern for COVID, I don't see the point of not testing. I, I think just for the sake of your family and for the place where you're working and other things, I think that would be peace of mind. Again, uh, particularly a South Asian question, I would see that for myself as well. Uh, it says, does eating rice or wheat increase the risk of heart disease? If yes, what's the recommended diet alternatives? Uh, our di primary diet is rice-based. Correct. And I think, uh, you know, uh, we had this discussion with, uh, with our, you know, one of our endocrinologists who was, who did the Red Sari uh, meeting with us last time, you know, typically white rice has been felt to have what is called a higher glycemic index. What that means is in, uh, in non-medical terms is any foods that you eat, which raises your blood sugar acutely, can put stress on your pancreas to release insulin. So acute rises or acute spikes in sugar are less healthy long-term than a slow release of sugar, so in general. And so people have mentioned white rice and other things, but I know the when we discussed this with RT, uh, our Dr. Ban, who's one of the endocrinologists at uh, Henry Ford last time, I mean, I think eating, again, three times rice, large amounts, you know, sambar, rasam, thai, you know, every single... Uh, routine and doing that, I, th I think it's not, it's not going to be good. 
I think a good mix, you know, I like to have a little bit of curd rice all, all the time. I mean, eating curd at the end, of the, they've always said soothens your stomach and other things. So I think it again boils down to moderation. The key thing to avoid is refined carbohydrates. You know, avoid processed foods. You know, Indian sweets are, are a big, big issue. And you know, in general, Indian snacks and other things, because it's not quality controlled, you know, they're all fried and they, we don't know the oil uh, which is being done. Now, I'm not saying that you should never eat it. You know, you have a function, once in a while you're going to have it. I mean, those, those are fine. I'm just talking about more of an habitual thing. In general, the more you stay away from refined carbs and eating simple sugars, for example, even banana has sugar, you know, apple has sugar and other things, but those are relatively simple sugars, which means you do not have the complexity and the refinement and the high spikes in sugar that you get with, with the uh, other, other things to eat. So I think a more balanced diet and in moderation is important rather than a specific diet. Um, so uh, definitely cutting down white rice overall is, is definitely good. So I would just add, uh, we had done a program which Karthik was referring on that uh, we had a dietitian too. Uh, uh, so Maria um, has yeah. brought yeah, a list of food which have high, high uh, glycemic index. So those foods should be avoided. Like rice comes, like don't blame it on rice, okay? The rice that we buy, uh, white rice, polished rice is bad because you are removing all the um, yeah, nutrient, the fiber, uh, vitamins that comes with it. Like if you eat a, a, you know, parboiled rice and as well as um, uh, brown rice, that, sh that should be good and moderate quantity. So moderation in life is good <laughs> overall, whether it is rice or getting angry or getting joy, everything in moderation is really good for your heart and your life. So uh, with so that, Greg, uh, I don't know, do you have that, uh, Maria sent out that uh, high glycemic index thing, so yes. maybe if you have it, you can forward yes. it to the group. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Suresh. Yes. Uh, probably this is covered as well, but it says how to avoid COVID-19 from grocery items, food, other boxed items, and transmission from outside. All right. So, so we talked about this earlier is that um, this is called fomite transmission, F-O-M-I-T-E, which means someone has coughed or there's an infected worker who has touched something, and then you go and touch it and you, then you get, get it. Um, the, the answer to the question is... Uh, as much as possible, we have to clean all of this. So for example, if you buy groceries, the key thing is don't reuse the grocery bags. If you're gonna reuse the grocery bags, you're gonna to have to clean and disinfect the grocery bags. Washing all the vegetables. Um, and then essentially trans, the best thing would be to, if you leave them, most of, the, most of the time the virus is said to die in about three to five days. Um, across, across stuff. If you take a general thing, there are some variations in some it lasts for a one to two days, in other three to four days, rather than breaking the head in general about three to four days. But obviously we're not going to leave perishable things like that in, uh, completely. So if you buy grapes, apples, you know, strawberries and fruits and other things, the key thing is the coronavirus does not get transmitted in food. It gets transmitted in things that people, so for example, if somebody comes to DoorDash, or Uber Eats and comes and delivers it, there's a higher likelihood of transmission from that person to you rather than actually in the food. So obviously you'll have to clean. So you immediately transfer things from the dish which they gave you to your own dish. And then obviously you wash your hands. And then the key thing in washing the hands is with soap, at least 20 seconds of scrubbing. And if you're using a disinfectant, typically you need to use a disinfectant which has about a 60 to 70% alcohol content. That's the national recommendation. Um, for uh, uh, cleaning in general. So for example, male, that's the other thing, right? The great, it's a greater likelihood of transmission of the virus through the male woman or male man rather than through the male because by the time the male was deposited, they, they have left it in the processing station, put it in the van and then brought it here, it's likely the virus has died. But the worst case scenario is you take the male, this is what we do at our home, we just write the date and we just put it in a spa. And then we just leave it for two to three, two or three days. Unless, you know, I just look at the mail immediately to see if there's anything urgent. If not, I just put it in a spot, then go and wash my hands completely and then leave it there for three days. And then I pick up the mail. It's just a, just a, a caution, meaning these are easy things that we can do. Yeah, common sense. Yeah. So uh, I had a personal question in the window. Uh, someone known to me is regularly have a lower heart rate. It's around 27 to 30. 
is this person having a higher risk, risk for heart attack? 27 to 30 is pretty low. So, uh, you know, the question is really I, what time of the day they are having it. But regardless, that's kind of low. If you are having a heart rate of 27 to 30 when you are awake, um, I would consider that definitely abnormal. And that needs to be evaluated by a cardiologist. If you are now, when we're all sleeping, our heart rate goes down. And, you know, we, I've, I've taken care of pistons and red wings, uh, folks who come to a hospital for testing. They've had uh, screening testing. We do uh, monitors on them. And uh, we've got red wings, uh, heart rates, which goes down into the 25s or 30s. That's because they are extremely conditioned. So everybody's heart rate goes down when they're sleeping. And people who are highly trained athletes and very conditioned or people who run regularly and other things, their heart rates can dip down into the 35s to 40s. Okay. But routinely having a twin heart rate of 27 to 30 is really uh, not completely normal. So you know, can they have a heart attack? Yeah, well, you know, theoretically, yes, because their heart is not getting enough blood flow because the heart rate is low. But I think the problem may be much more than that. So they're going to have to get that evaluated uh, properly. Raise your muted. Okay, I have a mechanistic question. It should be from a scientist. So, do you know? Do you know how Kabasura Kudinir uh, helps curing COVID nineteen? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> you please educate me. I don't know what that is. Okay, so Kabasura Kudinir is recommended uh, from Siddha Medicine System in India, and people used to take it, and they say it is uh, protecting them from it. It's prophylactic somebody even getting cured. I don't know. I, it's not a clinical trial. Again, it's just a very, very chavy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. But what, what, is, what is it actually? I don't even know what it is. What it, has, uh, it has a content. Like it's, it's already previously, there. it has been tested in many. Kaba Sura Kudini as the name. It has been tested in many. Kaba Sura Kudini as the name. It has been tested in many. Kaba Sura Kudini as the name. It has been tested in many. Kaba Sura Kudini as so uh, it's a formula that they I'm glad it's uh, I'm glad it's something uh, something uh, you know that we drink or we have normally because as you know in, I don't know if you saw in Gujarat people are drinking cow's urine right right the cow's urine is promoted in Gujarat to cure COVID or protect from COVID so that's why I was a little scared when you said some name I didn't recognize it so I wanted to make sure it's not something weird. Yeah, like and the um, chicken gunia, the lava and the pav and the uh, dengue fever could on Nila Vimbu could in the Tamil Nadu government take um, okay, uh, uh, so Ademiri Pakabasura could in it could to Kranga, so other party get to Kanga. Ingredients for the Italian Nila Vimbu, uh, Prakarpura Valley and the Marie Herbals, it's all a combination of asuration, it's a combination of herbals. You know, who knows? I mean, honestly speaking, they may have some value. It's just, we just don't know. I, I, I mean, uh, if they are harmless and they don't affect anything, the, the major challenge with, uh, with uh, the homeopathic treatments, because my patients come to me and ask me about homeopathic treatments, is they are, we just don't know how they interact with allopathic medications. And some of these wild um, plant-based things can rarely cause liver failure and other kind of things. So... We just are not educated. We're that. just not smart enough or educated enough to know all the details on these things. So uh, I would have to defer uh, those kinds of things to people who know. So, so that is uh, just to make a clarification. Uh, homeopathic is more of uh, you know iron and uh, like metals, and that's a little bit more toxic than yeah. Siddha. usually. Siddha is plant based, and it is already have a established system. Uh, so it's little Maybe safer. Yeah, yeah, little bit unknown. Okay, uh, Aparna, I don't know whether you have any personal uh, private uh, window question. I have a couple of them. No, I don't have any more, uh, Suresh. I'm, I'm good. Okay, so just like uh, this question is, just wanted to know dry throat and dry cough for senior person. Is it a concern, especially while laying down the dry cough comes? You know, there are, there are numerous causes for that. So uh, I would say this, the, uh, the most you know, common things for that is just because that they have not had enough water and stuff like that. Many people have to get up in the night to have it, but it could be a sign of reflux, which means again, you know, uh, some, when you lie down, sometimes a small amount of acid can get into the, your uh, breathing system and most people will wake up coughing. It can be a, sometimes a sign of heart problems where when you lie down and sleep at night, 
you can actually have increased pressure in the heart due to the fluid movement and you can have and then it could be due to medications so very difficult to say as a as a specific reason uh, the key thing would be that someone really evaluates you know don't uh, speak to your primary doctor and get it kind of evaluated to see what could be potentially the reason it could be something pretty simple and benign okay thank you uh, karthik the next one is um, what will be an ideal heart rate in other words what could be the heart rate when a person is under heart attack can we know that well the normal heart rate resting heart rates are anywhere between 60 to 100 and see all of us have two systems uh, let's keep the heart attack out for a little bit let's talk about normal scenario normally all of us have two systems which balance our body one is called the sympathetic system and this is a system which responds to any kind of stress that we have let's say we get excited we get angry we are ha happy or we are frightened for that matter the system actually causes the heart rate to go up accordingly to balance the body stress level then there is a system which actually keeps things down to balance the other system that's called the parasympathetic system that system keeps the heart rate down and so typically that's why at night when we sleep our heart rates are lower than when we are awake so the balance between these two systems in an individual determines our determines along with the environment what their heart rates are so if you are someone who leads a healthy lifestyle you exercise regularly and your heart will be much more conditioned it knows what it needs to do in a daily life and you will see that your heart rates are much more on the lower side typically between 50 to 70 if you're someone who doesn't exercise regularly or who's hyper type a personality stressed out not getting enough sleep angry uh, thing you may be someone whose heart rates are on the higher side in general the take home point is a higher heart rate is is less friendlier to the heart long term than a slower heart rate because you can understand clearly that the, if the heart is constantly beating at a faster rate it's like a race horse you know that's that's more Uh, uh that's more harmful to the heart long term uh than a slower heart rate um now in the heart attack is obviously a stressful situation right so your heart your artery is blocked so your body is going to respond by increase in heart rate most of the time but if the bl blood doesn't go to the heart muscle in a crucial area you can develop dramatic falls in heart rate so it can go both ways it all depends upon which artery is blocked and what's happening yeah very good if there is any question i can i'm just open this to uh, everyone uh, if you can if, if you want to ask some question you can ask uh, that is another question uh, from ganesh uh, saying getting cough and are constantly constantly feeling like clearing throat while running or exercise what could be the reason um is it, um again uh, need need a little bit more information if this is relatively new um you know um obviously it may need to be evaluated one potential possibility is something called uh, of uh, you know exercise asthma so some people can actually have exacerbation of asthma just with exercise and stress which can be manifested as kind of cough and uh, scenarios um and then there there could be other reasons it could there could be still a reflux problem and other things going on if it's a chronic scenario most likely it's a benign cause maybe just need to be evaluated a little bit more detail to get up okay there there are no more questions on the window or personal window uh like we we are 848 bare yaar kada edha kelvi irundha direct ave dr karthik kekla another unmute panninde kekla illa na naangalo vena ungala unmute pandrom neenga hand raise pandreengala andha mari panninga unmute pandrom okay can i can i can i ask a question sure sure the peer solunga venna avar karthik oda appa nu nenikira oh okay No. Yeah. Yes. 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 No. I'm actually being challenged. What is, what is your what's your comment about the Italian postmortem studies? Um, are you talking about the thromboembolic uh, problems? Yeah. Yeah. They say it's only DIC. It's not a pneumonia. Correct. So uh, it's a little bit more uh, medical, but I will explain it in the uh, in a simple way. So one of the things which is a real problem with COVID is. even though it looks like it is a respiratory illness the um uh, the mode of complications and death are much more dramatic with covid 
And one of the leading ways in which people are actually dying with COVID is developing clotting in multiple systems of the body, primarily in the, uh, in the lungs. And so uh, when I showed you that graph where you develop the third, the phase of inflammation, right? When the body reacts to that inflammation, it undergoes what is called a hyperacute inflammatory scenario, which, which activates the clotting system and people develop these clots uh, uh, in multiple areas of the lung. And so that's called pulmonary embolism. And that's dangerous and it's a, it can be fatal. And we have seen numerous unfortunate deaths, not only at Henry Ford, but across the United States. Um, and so one of the primary manifestations, I alerted all of you to the fact that heart attack can be a primary manifestation of COVID. Similarly, having clots in the body can be a primary manifestation of COVID. So just because you, you did not have cough, shortness of breath, et cetera, and you come in with a leg clot or a lung clot doesn't mean you don't have COVID. That may be the presenting manifestation of COVID. So we have learned that the disease is more than a respiratory disease. It's a, it acti activates a systemic system to cause diffuse clots and very small clots sometimes which uh, occlude the uh, pulmonary system causing failure of the lungs and ultimately the heart. Even if just you presented in some case. Yes. <laughs> oh, hi, Dr. Yeah, he said. Yeah. Yeah. You, may, you may want to comment on maybe aspirin prophylaxis. I think the public is very confused about this. Uh, this is for general cardiac? Yeah, general cardiac, yes. Right. Okay. So the question that Dr. Venkat had is, uh, what is the current evidence for aspirin prophylaxis? So the... Um, the current evidence is that people should not be indiscriminately taking baby aspirin for cardiovascular protection. Particularly if you're less than 75, the evidence is not favoring if you do not have cardiovascular disease. Um, if you have cardiovascular disease, please don't stop your baby aspirin. Uh, as advised by your cardiologist, please continue to take that. Now, the ex uh, here is again the exception the exception is there are a few exceptions to primary prophylaxis who can take baby aspirin. And one of those is actually South Asians. The American College of Cardiology identified South Asian descent independent high risk factor. So if your doctor feels that you from a baby aspirin, yeah, people, people should mute after they ask question. Everybody, please mute and then unmute when you want to ask question or any clarification. Thank you. Karthik, please continue. Yeah, so uh, the American College of Cardiology has identified our community, the South Asian descent, as an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So they actually have a separate column saying that these uh, certain folks, including South Asian descent, may actually benefit from aspirin because their risk is much higher. So the bottom line to answer Dr. Venkat's question is if you have existing disease, meaning prior history of heart attacks, known blockages in the arteries, prior bypass surgery, angioplasty, um, et cetera, and your doctor has put you on aspirin, very reasonable to stay on it. If you are South Asian and have diabetes, hypertension, and other risk factors, and you have discussed with your doctor, and the, your doctor feels that aspirin may be indicated, you may be justified. And the important thing to understand is when you take any medicine, you have to do a risk benefit analysis. When you take baby aspirin, you essentially get a small risk of lifetime bleeding. So if a very, if a, so if a 25 year old person who has no risk comes to and says, you know what, I want to take a baby aspirin to prevent heart attack, the risk there of him bleeding is much higher than developing a heart attack. Because what is the likelihood that a 25 year old is going to develop a heart attack over the next 10, 20 years. Very low, right? So you don't want to expose people unnecessarily to taking a baby aspirin. However, if you have adequate risk factors and South Asian ancestry is one of them, it is pretty reasonable. Now, about the age of 75, again, we have to define the risk. So people above the age of 75, just by their age, fall into the higher risk category for heart disease. And, but at the same time, they are at a higher risk of bleeding. So you have to look at the entire picture and decide if it would be reasonable to put those patients also on a baby. So it's individualized patient shared decision making. You have to sit with your doctor, talk, 
and figure it out. Okay, any other questions from audience? I have a quick question. Yes. Um, if you don't mind. Uh, I have been reading uh, that somebody who's taking Jumeirah for any arthritis or any such condition uh, is immunosuppressant. But I also read recently that Jumeirah is helping people with, with uh, COVID. Uh, which way is the benefit or the disadvantage of Shimera? Correct. So obviously for the general group, uh, you know, Shimera is actually an immunomodulating agent used in rheumatoid arthritis. And the, the bottom line is the fact that you've got rheumatoid arthritis and are, and are on a disease-modifying agent makes you a higher risk for COVID just by the risk factors that we talked about. There is literature to support that because of this hyperacute inflammatory response and the immune system of someone's body acting against it, because you're using an immunomodulating agent, maybe that may help. It. Right now, there is no evidence that Chimera actually has direct influence. There are studies going on with immunomodulating agents used. Um, there is some early literature on some of those agents, but the answer is, if you are using that agent for rheumatoid arthritis and it's helping you, there is no reason to stop. And I want to take this opportunity to, to basically also say that if you are taking uh, angiotensin, uh, 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 what is called ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker, these are common medications which your doctors give you for hypertension like lisinopril or uh, enalapril or, um, or uh, losartan or valsartan. These are agents that we use. Please do not stop them. There is no evidence to say that just because these, uh, these medications work through the same enzyme as COVID, some, some initial concerns were raised that people who are on these medicines may have a higher risk for COVID infection. And that has been proven so far conclusively as wrong. Similarly, there was early evidence from China and in Italy to suggest that taking non-steroidals for pain, like uh, Motrin, anaprox, ibuprofen, et cetera, could be harmful. That has now been disproven. So if you are taking that for a specific reason and your doctor believes that you need to be taking it, you don't need to stop it. But in general, routinely taking those agents is not good for your heart and kidneys long term. So you have to discuss with your doctor, if you're taking it for severe pain and other things and you need that medicine, you have to take it. But don't in general routinely take these over-the-counter anti-inflammatory agents because they are associated with higher risk of heart attacks in the future and they affect the kidneys and the stomach too. Thank you. Thank you for a nice elaborate answer. And uh, you brought other medication that people might be taking uh, should be continued. Uh, okay. I have one blanket statement to make because just because we are being South Asians, we are having higher risk of heart disease, don't panic, okay? That's the last thing we want to do, okay? You have to just aware that you have to avoid certain things, that's all, and be careful and take go with your routine life. It's like you are going in a freeway saying that there is a curve, slow down, okay? Be careful, that's what we are trying to do. It. It's not to panic anybody. We are advantaged in a lot of ways. A lot of us, you know, can do math, science very well. So you see positive side of being your ancestral genes. Just don't blame them giving heart disease or diabetes. Okay. And if you follow a good lifestyle, we all going to live happily and healthy. That's what we want to educate. We don't want to scare you. I want to pass this message across the community. Here, we are there to just to educate you so that you modify your lifestyle risk. Okay, don't, I, I'm working. So I am an IT coder. I can, uh, without sleep, I can stay for, you know, up to two o'clock in the morning because I need to finish this bug. No, you have to take rest. And okay, I'm doing social drinking. So there is another common misconception among our communities. I'm not like, I'm not going to, trash people drinking, but the way we drink is wrong. That is, people just research in Google, it says that alcohol is good for your heart. Okay, that is a French paradox. That is a particular focus on people who socialize with drink, very small drink with cheese and a lot of music. You know, it is a, it is a um, happy feeling for them. Like South Asians typically are Indians or Tamils typically drink at V hours, okay, with a lot of snacks. Again, as Karthik was telling, a lot of carbohydrate added to it, okay? And you lose your sleep, you don't drink water, okay? This all has a, I work on alcohol enzyme as far my research. So 
they are the alcohol conversion the metabolism takes essential element from day to day enzyme activity so if you are drinking too much that's going to take some chemicals that needed for essential function so drink in moderation and drink with water drink in data i mean not at the v hours okay so these are the common mistakes people do it not sleeping right not eating right and you know not following rules of certain things of our basic biochemistry okay so with that you all will be good and do good just just you had to do exercise and eat right that's what the message we want to convey not to scare any of you so if there is no any other question i will leave uh, the dais to aparna to uh, conclude the session uh, with that i am uh, taking off thank you very much for everyone for coming and listening kartik especially kartik and dr thank Ven you thank you for the opportunity yeah and dr ananda subramaniam and dr hema venkat all all uh, people who are in healthcare thank you very much and the audience aparna aparna you are on mute thank you dr karthik uh, thank you for your time thank you for a much information session uh, it's like one and a half hours nothing but information we'll definitely carry it through and hope to follow it soon and lead a healthy life uh, thanks suresh for organizing this uh, information session through red sari event uh, we'll be having many more sessions like this uh, so that we just keep uh, you know people aware of what things are happening around us to thank lead you, thank a you. healthy life Thank you for the opportunity. Good night, everyone. Take yeah. Good night. Personally, thank you, Aparna, for um, um, taking care of the healthcare aspect also in through Tamil Changam. This is really incredible in the COVID situation. You know, people learn more uh, just being at home. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night.